I absolutely love these mini PCs. And when Geekcom reached out and said, hey, do you want to check out our brand new mini IT13? I said to them, hey guys, what are the specs like? What are we looking at here? And they said, the version that we're sending you has the Intel Core i9-13900H. You had me at a 14 core in a tiny little box. Let's take a closer look. The thing I love about these mini PCs is their form factor. And the IT13 is a viable option if you're looking for a PC in a small form factor that doesn't make a heck of a lot of noise and is super powerful. So the version that we've got here features the Intel Core i9-13900H. Believe it or not, can boost up to 5.4 gigahertz. There are a few different variants of this, but in terms of the specs for this one in particular, this one's got a two terabyte Gen 4 NVMe M.2 drive and 32 gigs of RAM. Intel's kind of retired their whole NUC series of computers and they're offloading them onto ASUS at the moment. But what's interesting about this is before Intel decided to do this again with another hardware partner, the rest of the mini PC companies were scrambling to make a super powerful small computer. And this is where the IT13 comes in. But let's take a look and see what you get with this thing. This is everything you're gonna find in the box with the Geekcom Mini IT13. First of all, we've got a power cable. This is an American power cable. I've got my own one that I had to use because I'm not in America, so it doesn't work here. We've also got the screws for visa mounting with the included visa mounting bracket. So the idea behind a bracket like this is you can mount the mini PC onto the back of your monitor if you wanted to have a really sleek and elegant mounting solution and if you never wanted to see the computer. You've also got the power brick. This is a 19 volt 6.32 amp power brick with 120 watts of output because the 13900H can draw up to around about, I think 115 watts. So you've got a bit of overhead here with this big old power brick. On top of that, you've got some documentation. This basically shows you how to get inside, which we're gonna cover in a second. And thank you. Now I wanted to read this because it reads, Dear customer, thank you for purchasing our products to facilitate your daily life. We hope they serve you well. Your trust and support are greatly appreciated. If you have any questions, blah, blah, blah. So you can read that. On the other side of this was Geekcom was founded in 2003, which means Geekcom has been around for 20 years. And this is the first time I'm hearing about them. So, you know. That's very interesting. And last but not least, we've got an HDMI cable. So you can see all of the things when you plug it into your monitor. Getting inside the IT13 is a fairly simple affair. You'll notice there's four feet on the case. They're also the screws to get into the case. Traditionally, you would use a screwdriver to loosen these up to get in. However, I noticed that once I loosen them up once, to get in doesn't require any tools. And then we loosen them up by finger. It can be a little bit tricky. It's a very snug fit, which is a good thing. And then we fold it out this way because there is an attached SATA cable here for an SSD, which we'll get to in a moment. But as you can see inside of it, it's not very complex. We've got a pre-installed M.2 drive. This is a Lexar drive. This is a two terabyte PCIe Gen 4 NVMe M.2 drive. There's also a 2230 slot, so you can put in a second drive if you've got one of the smaller form factor drives. This has 32 gigs of DDR4 sodium memory pre-installed. I think this is 3200 mega transfers from memory. It also will allow you to go up to 64 gigs. There's an M.2 heatsink that is built into the bottom of the case and it's a solid piece of aluminium with this big thermal pad. The key knight out there will see that there is a ribbon cable that goes from the inside of the case to the case. This is a SATA connector. Essentially how this works is if we take a look at the panel again, when we close it, there's four rubber grommets. If we just pull those rubber grommets out, it will expose some screw holes. That's because 
you could install your own SATA drive in here. It just plugs in. Now it's up to you whether or not you want to put screws in to hold it because this is very solid. You can put this back in its correct orientation and then you can have an additional SSD installed in here. So actually you could do three drives in here if you really, really wanted. Much like a lot of the other mini PCs that you see around the place, this one shares the same type of modularity. On the front of the IT13, we've got two USB type A ports. There's a fast charging port. Both of these are 10 gigabit type A ports. There's also a headphone jack and a microphone jack. They're combined as well as a power button with a combined power LED. If we turn around to the back of the IT13, this is where this gets very, very interesting. Two USB type C ports. They're both 40 gigabit. They both support DisplayPort as well. There's two HDMI ports back there. One of them is USB 2.0. The other one is USB 3.2. It's a 10 gigabit port. And for networking, this one features 2.5 gigabit wide ethernet. This also has an included SD card slot on the side of the computer. Not only that, for wireless networking connectivity, you've got Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.2. Unlike the B-Link SER4, which we covered last year, the Geekom IT13 doesn't have mesh panels everywhere. It's got intake and exhaust on the sides, as well as some vents on the rear of the machine because it has a blower style cooler. All right, this is what the BIOS looks like in the IT13. Actually, there's not a whole lot to look at here, but I thought I would share this with you anyway. The main page shows the CPU, which is the 13900H, shows how much memory we've got, which is 32 gigs of DDR4 memory at 3200 mega transfers. It also allows us to set the fan mode here, so you can go quiet, normal, and performance. And that's basically it. For security settings, there's really nothing here. Boot settings, you can change the boot priority if you want to. Yeah, there's just not a whole lot to look at with the BIOS settings with the IT13. Sorry to disappoint. The other thing with this is it doesn't allow you to choose how much video memory is allocated to the iGPU. I think that is a tiny bit of an oversight, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. The IT13 comes with Windows 11 Pro pre-installed, and I've just got Task Manager up here so you can see the specs of the CPU. We've got 20 threads in total and 14 CPU cores. It's currently running at a round almost four gigahertz when it's doing nothing here. I'm pretty sure it's either updating a game or doing a Windows update in the background. You can see that for memory, it's running at 3200 mega transfers and it's sodium memory and both slots are occupied. For ethernet, this is actually connected to a one gig switch at the moment. So it's not gonna show the full 2.5 gig. And for the GPU here, you can see the Intel Iris Xe graphics. I don't know why they don't just call it Z because it's XE. Everyone just calls it XE. I think it's just, just be Z, right? I don't know. Here's a test that I do quite often with these mini PCs and for integrated graphics is running games that are super optimized. This is Forza Horizon 5. I'm just gonna drive around a little bit to show you guys what the performance looks like. This is running at 720p low. And I mean, if I'm not crashing into things, this car's very slidey. We're, seeing around about 48 to around 60 fps with these settings here at night time i think with the lighting it's a little bit more intense but yeah we'll just see what happens i'll just drive around a little bit so you guys can get a bit of an experience of what it's like to game on this thing this may or may not be your cup of tea this may not be something that you would be interested in doing on a system like this but wow yeah it's actually running pretty good. Let's crank up the settings a bit. Let's change it to the medium preset and see if it makes much of a difference in performance. At 720p medium, it looks a fair bit better. And we are seeing a quite a big drop in performance, but realistically, it's not a big deal. It still feels very smooth to play like this. Probably not your preferred way to play Forza, but it is an integrated GPU and it's, it just shows how far integrated GPUs have come over the years. 
especially with things like the ROG Ally, that thing is crazy good for titles like this. So even at 1080p, we're getting, oh, it's, it's not the best frames per second. And this is 1080p medium as well. So it's not looking terrible. Wow, I am really bad at driving this car. Let's quickly swap cars. This one's not as slippery. Still quite slippery, but yeah. I can actually keep this one on the road. Yeah, this isn't running too bad. Yeah, not terrible at all. Moving over to our regular suite of benchmarks, the ones we use for iGPUs, we test in both Windows and Linux. We switched to Fedora 38 for all of our testing. At 720p low, you can see the performance is fine. At 720p medium, the performance is not too bad. It is playable at these frame rates. However, at 1080p low, we see that, that drops down to 20 frames per second and 17 frames per second respectively. Going over to Unigen Superposition, you can see that the performance here is not terrible. Remember, this is an integrated GPU, not a discrete GPU. So the numbers that we're seeing here aren't too bad. The only issue with all of these benchmarks, especially with iGPUs is I don't have a lot to go on because I don't have a lot to compare this to. And that's just the reality of it. We don't get many of these mini PCs through the studio. So it's hard for me to give you anything to compare this to full stop. You'll notice that some of these benchmarks in Linux, especially the ones that use Proton, will not launch. Basically, they just crash out when they launch. And I thought I would just add that in there just to show you that it doesn't always work in Linux. I did try this with Ubuntu as well, and we have the same issue. So yeah, I thought that was worth mentioning, considering we do get a lot of questions about Linux performance in these videos, and I added it because you guys love to hear it. Let's move on to some thermals. The thermals that we record are the core temperature thermals and the package thermals. You can see that we're maxing out at around 77 degrees Celsius in our 18 degree climate controlled office for the core temperature and the package temperature hits around 79 degrees Celsius on average. We do see spikes up to around 99 degrees, which is the absolute maximum that you'll want to hit. However, there is no throttling whatsoever. So the cooling solution in the IT13 is not terrible. In terms of power draw, this one was quite interesting because I thought we would get close to that maximum envelope for power draw. However, in the BIOS, as shown before, we don't have many settings to change and we can't tune that a whole lot more. So at idle, we're seeing about seven watts power draw and maxing out at around 75 watts over one hour of stress testing. Here's something I thought you guys might find interesting. Let's take a little bit of a listen to the IT13 in the different fan modes when we put it under max load. I've been tinkering with this mini PC for a little while and I had a Thunderbolt 3 Aorus gaming box laying around and I was like, you know what, let's just plug it in and see if it works. Surprisingly, it works with Thunderbolt 3 external GPUs. However, the real twist is the gaming box I had had a 2070 in it and I thought to myself, well, the gaming box has a PCIe by 8 slot. And it's very small and I cannot fit a bigger GPU in it. So I made my own. This is an RTX 4060 Ti. It's the fastest PCIe by eight graphics card on the market. Although this is PCIe Gen 3 with Thunderbolt 3, I was like, let's give it a crack. So let's do all of those benchmarks again, comparing this to our regular GPU test bench and see what the story is. <laughs> You're gonna be surprised. What we're doing here is we're comparing a 4060 Ti Gaming X from MSI on our 12900K test bench 
with the Mini IT13 from Yecom. And you can see that in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, there is a fair bit of loss in performance with 1440p and 1080p, and that's usually what we see with Thunderbolt. With Unigen Superposition, it's more of the same, where 1080p Extreme is quite surprising because the performance is basically the same. That's with a Margin of Error, and with 4K, it's also very close as well. When we move on to Cyberpunk 2077, we can see that there is quite a limitation over Thunderbolt 3 here with the 4060 Ti. This is usually the case when you use an external GPU. Remember, we also have the display connected directly into the external GPU, so there is no display coming back through the Thunderbolt cable either. And lastly, onto Horizon Zero Dawn, we're seeing more of the same here with the eGPU, especially at 1440p, coming nowhere near the performance as it would with our test bench. Here's something I wanted to show you guys as well, because you might be interested. For content creation in Photoshop, you'll notice that the internal graphics is better than an external GPU for some of these tests, and you would actually have no issue not using an external GPU. The same thing can't be said for Premiere Pro though, whereas it's clear that the external GPU does help in every single aspect here and it's double the score with the RTX 4060 Ti. One thing I would thought was worth mentioning with the IT13 is the fact that I think it has one big limiting factor in terms of performance, and that is the use of DDR4 memory. I understand why they've done that. It's probably to cut costs, and they probably had the motherboard from an earlier version of the system and they've soldered in a newer CPU, but I think it could have stretched its legs a little bit further with some DDR5 memory. So Geekom, if you're watching this, can you answer this question for me? Why didn't you use DDR5 memory? Other than that, I think the performance is pretty spot on, and what we saw with eGPU testing, well, with my janky eGPU, the performance is also not terrible as well. You are limited by the bandwidth of Thunderbolt and you're not gonna get the full performance of an external GPU with a setup like this, but it is interesting if you're wanting to upgrade your system at a later date and keep this as a base. There's also some other interesting use cases for an enclosure like that as well. Let's say you wanted to build out a storage server. You could use the internal 2.5 gigabit ethernet for connecting it to your network. Inside that enclosure, you could put an HBA and have a disk shelf connected to it. So there's lots of very interesting use cases and it might be something that we come back to because I think I wanna try that out, connecting up a disk shelf to something like this. I, I think it'd be very interesting. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. If you're interested in the Geekon Mini IT 13, they're starting from 499 US dollars going up to around $789 for the configuration that we've got here. That's got 32 gigs of RAM and a two terabyte NVMe M.2 drive. What would be really cool is if they sold this in a bare bone unit that had no memory and no storage and you could do that yourself because as you saw earlier in the video, getting into this is one of the easiest experiences that I've ever seen for a mini PC. And if you wanna see more mini PC content, let us know down below in the comments because I've been trying to get more of these for years and we were supposed to get some more from B-Link and Minis Forum, but they just didn't come. So let's hound them, let's get more of these PCs. Anyways, if you like the music you heard here, I make all the music. It's available by clicking that join button right down there down below. Once again, thank you so very much for watching. I'm your boy Nick with Gear Seekers, who absolutely loves tiny computers. You peak. We see again. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching. Also, look how janky this thing is. <laughs> I'm using zip ties to hold it together as like one external GPU. I might leave it like this. This thing is really, really cool. And the bonus of this is I can just swap any GPU in here that has a single eight pin PCIe power connector. I can change this. This is just a flex ATX PSU as well. So if I wanted to, I could make this a whole video on its own.